Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. A few weeks ago, a young friend of mine gave me a plaque that she had made, and, and uh, it was really profound. It said, the best things in life aren't things. And you know, when you, you think about it, she's really, really hit the importance of the gospel. Well, I want to start by telling you a, a couple of stories about my family, if you don't mind. A few years ago, my wife and I went out to Northern California to visit my daughter and her family. And she lives so far up in Northern California near the El Dorado National Forest that it's not even on GPS. <laughs> and if you go for a morning jog, you need to be careful because there are bear, there are wolves, and there you could even be confronted by a mountain lion, which happened to my daughter. So it's a pretty beautiful place, but it's really in the boondocks. And while we were there, Rocco decided he was going to have a lemonade stand. And so we made it a family project. He and his father, who's a, a master carpenter, built the stand. And then his mom, who's quite an artist, she painted, helped him paint some of the signs, Rocco's lemonade. And then we decided to sit down and decide how we were going to do this. We decided on the, the recipe for sugar-free lemonade and sugar lemonade. Then I said to him, Rocco, I got an idea. Why don't we give out three peanuts? And Rocco looked at me like I was crazy. I said, Rocco, the more peanuts people eat, the more they'll want to drink lemonade. <laughs> now, not to be outdone, Rocco said, yeah, then people want to use the bathroom, we can charge them for that, too. <laughs> I said, no, Rocco, that's called customer service. <laughs> so the big day finally came. We got everything set up, and about noon time, people started rolling in, a few in the beginning, and then as the day went on, the, the crowd started building, and people started bringing lawn chairs, and they were sitting on the street, and pretty soon, what turned out as a simple lemonade stand ended up being a block party. <laughs> I was amazed to watch all this going on. And then, all of a sudden, pickup trucks, were starting to pull up and getting lemonade. And I thought, wow, now Rocco's got a drive-through. <laughs> and then later, later on, his dad got some messages, said, we're not on a construction site. Does Rocco deliver? <laughs> sure, Rocco delivers. And he did just that. It was amazing. At the end of the day, I said, Rocco, this was really quite a success, wasn't it? And he said, yeah. He said, now, Grandpa, tell me I got a plan. You know, it's going to be Halloween. So what I'm going to do is build a campfire in the backyard, charge for cider, and let people sit around the fire, roast marshmallows, and tell ghost stories. I said, this kid's really onto something. And he's only in third grade. <laughs> well, it all went well. And then he made some money. And we said, what are you going to do with it, Rocco? And he said, well, I'm going to give some to the local animal shelter, because he likes to go down there and see the animals. And then he said, I'm going to give some to the, to the local group of, of hotshot fire, uh, hot shot fire uh, fighters, those guys who uh, uh, are famous for their ability to go in and, and fight fires, the forest fires that are so prevalent in California. Well, fast forward to this past summer. Rocco and his family came here to celebrate his 10th birthday, and we had talked for years about going to places like the Museum of Natural History, which we did. We had a great time. He, he was marveled, marveled by the, uh, the dinosaurs and the, the great blue whale and all those things. And I said to his, his mom before she came, I said, what's Rocco like to do at night? She said, well, I'm not much into television, but uh, he likes to play board games. So I said, what board game? And she said, he likes Monopoly. I said, good, I'll pick up a Monopoly game. She said, well, Dad, you know, so I got to tell you. He is ruthless when it comes to monopoly. <laughs> so how ruthless got a 10-year-old kid, right? Wow. We played for several hours. And at the end of the night, Rocco had the biggest stack of money. He had the most properties, the most utilities. He had the most hotels and the most houses. And then an interesting thing happened. 
At the end of the game, it all went back into the box. Now think about that for a second, because isn't that the way life is? At the end of the game, it all goes back in the box. Now let's be honest, you've never seen a trailer behind a hearse. They just don't do that. They just don't do that. This morning, we find that a man is being challenged in Jesus, and, and he's being challenged by Jesus. He comes up to Jesus, and, and he kneels down. He's, he's obviously very, very concerned, very upset. He says, Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Perhaps a loved one had recently died, or a friend of his was very sick, or perhaps he himself was getting on in years and realized there were more days behind him than ahead of him. And said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And then Jesus says to him, well, you know, you've got to be good. And you've got to not commit murder, not steal, not lie, not slander, all those things that the Ten Commandments. And the man said, yeah, I, I, I've done all those things since I was a little kid. A bit of an exaggeration for sure, but this was a good man. But you get what Jesus was doing here? Boy, Jesus could be slick sometimes. Because he talked about all those commandments that deal with human relations, about how we get along with one another. But he didn't talk about, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before you. Honor the Sabbath, keep it holy. Don't make any graven images of me. All those ones that deal with the relationship with God. And now it was time for Jesus to say, let's really check your priorities. I want you to go sell everything you have and then give the money to the poor and then come and be a follower of mine. And the man had a look of horror on his face. And he said, no, I, I can't do that. I spent my whole life working for this stuff. I'm going to go someplace else and see what some other teacher has to say. Now, it's important that we realize that this guy was a good guy. He wasn't like that, that crooked tax collector Zacchaeus who you know, cheated people all the time until he met up with Jesus. He wasn't like those, those money changers or those merchants in the, in the temple courtyard that were constantly cheating people when they came to worship. He was a good guy. But Jesus challenged his priorities. He recognized that the man loved his wealth much more than he loved Jesus and he loved God. Now, listening to the exchange, the disciples were a little bit concerned. They were wondering, what, what, how did we get saved? Peter, old wishy-washy Peter, you know, he's the guy that could step up and say great profound things one minute and then put his foot in his mouth the next. He was the guy that said, Jesus, you are the Messiah. You're the Son of God. You're the one who's come to save us. Only you have the words of eternal life. And then he could argue about, with Jesus about how he was going to be that Savior. And now he comes to Jesus and he says, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Jesus, let, let's count the cost here. We have given up everything, everything, to be your followers. Jesus reminds him that, yeah, there will be blessings. There's sacrifices, but there's also going to be blessings. And he says, if you want to be a follower of mine, you've got to take up your cross. Follow me. Make me your number one priority. I want your ultimate commitment. The story is told of an eagle who was flying around in the north woods one day. It was winter. And he looked down and he saw this branch that was, was floating down the river. And it was covered with ice. So he reached down, he flew down with his talons, he grabbed onto that branch. And he held onto it for a couple of minutes. And then he realized that that branch, that branch was moving towards a waterfall. And he tried to let go. But now, instead of him having the branch, the branch had him. His talons were, were frozen to the branch. And he went to his death. 
And he, a few weeks ago, in the gospel lesson, Jesus asked the question, he said, what good does it do for a person to, to gain the whole world, but in the end, to lose their soul? And that's a question all of us have to answer. And the question that Jesus was asking the man in our, in our gospel lesson, when he asked us as well, now, when it comes to your possessions, do you own your possessions, or do your possessions own you? We live in a world that says, more is better. You've got to get something new all the time. And somehow, we measure our value by what we own. By what we own. Jesus also said, don't seek in this world, don't seek after those things where moth and rust destroy and, and thieves break in and steal. Instead, put your, put your treasures in heaven. And then he also said, you know, that uh, where your treasures are, that's where your heart's going to be as well. What's our heart's desire? Those are tough, tough questions. It was our own Martin Luther who once said, I have had many things in my hands and lost them all, but the things that I put in God's hands, I still possess. Luther also said, if God has given you wealth, give thanks to God and see that you make good use of it. You know, we must never forget for a second that every single thing we have is a trust from God. He blesses us with so many things that all too often we take those things for granted. <coughs> Story is told about a teacher at Christmas time, and she was a grade school teacher, and the, uh, the kid brought her Christmas gifts. And the first boy walked up to her desk, and the boy's father owned a, a candy store in town. And he put the box down, the teacher opened it, and there was this big box of Godiva candy. And boy, she was going to have a sweet Christmas. The second girl walked up. She put the box on the table. Now, her father owned a little flower shop. She opened up the box, and there was this beautiful, beautiful bouquet of flowers. Then the third boy walked up. Now, his father owned a liquor store. Had a wet spot on the side. So the teacher touched the wet spot, said, Johnny, is it champagne? Johnny said, No. <coughs> she touched it again, put it to her lips, put it to her tongue, and said, Is it brandy? No. She did it a third time, touched her tongue, and he said, It's a puppy. <laughs> If anybody knows you're a teacher, be careful. <laughs> now, think about those three gifts, all right? Think about those three gifts. Which one really, really had lasting value? She'd probably try and eat that whole box of candy, and pretty soon she'd be, she'd be up cursing that little boy. It went from my lips to my hips, and boy, I you know. And those flowers would die after about a week. But that puppy was going to give her unconditional love and companionship for years to come. You know, our stewardship is a testimony of our faith and trust in God. Do we really, really believe that God loves us enough to provide not everything we want, but what we truly need? Do we always trust that, that God will, will be there for us and provide for us? Remember Jesus said, you know, God knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows the flight of every, every swallow. He knows what's going on. He knows what you need. And he'll provide it for you. And then think about the Old Testament people who wandered around the desert for 40 years. He made sure they had good water to drink. They had manna to eat. And when that wasn't enough, he made sure they had quail every single day. He said, I want you to learn to trust me, to care for your daily needs. Now, if you question God's love, I'd say, look, look at the cross. Look at the cross and see what he did for you and for me. That's amazing. That, that's, that's the kind of love that God has for us. And it also tells us about the power of God. The cross shows us that he has the power to turn rejection into acceptance. 
condemnation into forgiveness. Hate into love.